بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد respected elders and dear brothers the ongoing onslaught the attack and the war against hijab the onslaught against the niqab the burqa the islamic dress code in particular modest dress in general started from the beginning as an ideological onslaught it was an ideological attack the tactics that were used were aimed at persuading and manipulating the perception of people and creating a negative perception about hijab about the niqab the veil and the burqa so different mediums were used through propaganda through the different media outlets through different social media platforms we find that constantly and initially there was this attack and ongoing onslaught against hijab hijab was referred to as a symbol of oppression the hijab and the niqab or the burqa was referred to as a symbol of male domination it was referred to as restriction of expression and these different tactics were used so this was the idea decades ago however we find that this approach the onslaught or the ideological onslaught is one that had failed yuriduna liyutfiu nur allah bi afwahihim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that they wish and they want and their desire is to put out and to put off to eliminate the nur of Allah. Wallahu mutimmu nuri. Allah says Allah will allow his nur the light of Islam Allah will allow it to reach perfection. Allah will allow it to reach its peak. Allah will complete his nur. Walau kariha al-kafirun even though the disbelievers dislike it. Even though they are disgusted at the hijab. Even though they dislike the Muslim attire. Even though they cannot tolerate the burqa, the hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make sure that that nur whether it is in the form of hijab whether it is in the form of any other symbol of islam regardless of their feelings and their perception and their attempts allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow it to reach perfection in a tafsir al saadi under the commentary of this ayah he says that this is a very powerful metaphor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses over here. Tashbihu al-ma'aqul bil mahsus. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this metaphor, the one who attempts to extinguish, to put out the light of Allah by using propaganda, by using their mouths, by using media. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says their failure in doing so is compared to the one who stands outside and he blows towards the sun hoping to put out the flames of the sun 
Subhanallah, look at the imagery. It's so incredible. Allah says, that is their attempts. And that is what they are trying to do. And they have failed. So we find, subhanallah, that even though for decades there was this ideological onslaught and the target were the minds of the believers and the minds of the broader community to create a negative perception about the attire of the Muslim woman in particular and the Islamic modest dress in general, their attempts have failed. And history proves that whenever this attempt of this, the onslaught on the idea and the perception, the ideological onslaught, whenever it failed, they now adopted a more aggressive approach. They now legislated certain laws that forced you to now comply to the un-Islamic ideology. When our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first announced that he is a Nabi and that he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the final messenger of Allah, you find that the onslaught against him was an ideological one. It started as an ideological one. They wished to persuade, to manipulate, to indoctrinate the minds of the community in Makkatul Mukarramah and the broader community to the extent that when people came for Hajj, during the Hajj period when the Arabs came from all different parts of the peninsula, they would attack the Prophet وسلم, using this tactic and this approach, the ideological onslaught. They would say, Huwa Sahir, he is a magician. Kadhab, he is a liar. Ya ayyuhaladhi nuzzila alayhi dhikru inna kala majnoon. You are a madman, you are insane. But they failed. The propaganda and the tools of propaganda that they use, they use every available means. To attack the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to try and create this negative perception in the minds of the people regarding him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when that failed, then they used a more aggressive approach. Then the torture started. Physical punishment started. There was the economy, economic sanctions. There was the boycott. So that is the system of such people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against them. And now we find that once that ideological war was lost by them, and they failed in the ideological attack against the hijab and the burqa and the Muslims' attire, once they failed on that front, the ideological front, now we have seen over the past few decades, over the past few years, that now they are legislating laws and they are implementing laws that will force them to give up and abandon the hijab. That is now the more aggressive approach. Because the Muslim woman, they may refer to her hijab as a symbol of oppression. They may refer to her hijab as a symbol of male domination, but she knows that the hijab is a symbol of her obedience and submission to Allah. That's what the hijab is recently. Someone made a comment to me and they said, what's all the noise about? The hijab is just a piece of cloth. I said, no, the hijab is not just a piece of cloth. The hijab is her symbol of submission to the command of Allah. And in that lies her freedom. In that lies her freedom of expression. And the Muslim woman, by and large, alhamdulillah, she understood that. She knows that I am putting on the hijab and I am wearing the jilbab. I am covering and I am veiling. I am adopting the Islamic attire because that is what my Allah wants from me. That is what my Allah has asked me. Very often you'll find 
that even her spouse may not agree with the decision that she takes. Very often, and it is sad, unfortunately, that sometimes even the father may not support the decision of the daughter who wishes to don the hijab. But she's not doing it for her father. She is not doing it for her husband. She is doing it to impress and to please Allah. And that is why, that is why that nur that Allah spoke of, the nur that is in her heart, they will try and eliminate it, they will try and put it off, they will try and extinguish it. But that is the nur of Allah that's in her heart. The nur of Allah that's in her heart, that is what compels her. That is what is forcing her to abide by the Islamic dress code. That they cannot extinguish. With all the propaganda, with all the media, with all the lies, and everything else out there, that they cannot extinguish, and they realize that they have failed. She will not stop wearing the hijab, because the hijab to her is not just a piece of cloth. The hijab is her expression of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it means to her. We are all probably aware of the recent events in India where we find that in the Karnataka state, the southwest state of India, there were some girls, it started off in early January. There were some Muslim girls who were prohibited from entering a center of learning because they had on the niqab, they were veiled. And as a result of that, the issue then snowballed into a statewide issue. And there were protests and counter-protests. And much had taken place. Many of us are aware of it. Many of us may not be aware of it. But it is something that concerns every one of us. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, مَن لَمْ يَهْتَمْ بِأَمْرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ if the affairs of the Muslims in any part of the world does not concern you or does not make you become anxious and does not worry you, then you do not belong to the Muslims. Rasul Sallallahu has compared us to one body. And we know the famous hadith where he says that when one body suffers any pain, when one part of the body suffers pain or suffers sickness, suffers illness, the rest of the body reacts, and the reaction is a natural reaction. You don't have to be called, called on to react. The other parts of the body and the rest of the body naturally react. It's a natural reaction. Why? Because you belong to that body. And if there is no natural reaction, what does that mean? I'm not part of the body. And that's what Rasulullah says in the hadith. So the issue then went to the High Court of Karnakata State in India. And now in the week, the beginning of this week, we find that the High Court of the Karnakata State, they have upheld the ban. Unfortunate, but not surprising. So here we find another country or one state within India has now used the other tactic. The ideological war, the ideological battle and the ideological onslaught on the hijab, they failed in that front. And now they wish to use a different approach. And they have legislated law now that Muslim women are not allowed to veil themselves, to put on the hijab when going into these centers of learning. When we look at hijab, the veil, whether you refer to it as the headscarf or the burqa or the jilbab, the outer garment, the Islamic dress code and attire for the woman, when we look at it historically and religiously, you find that it was not Islam that introduced the khimar or that introduced the hijab. Yes, Islam perfected it. But when we look at it historically, you will find that there were many nations in the past. Ancient Mesopotamia, 
In ancient Mesopotamia, the elite woman, it was the mark and it was the trademark of elite women that they should be fully veiled. And the veil, donning the veil, not just the veil, but the full Islamic attire and garb, there is proofs that suggest that this was introduced to the world by people of other faiths, even people that belong to paganistic faiths. Even such people had introduced it approximately 2000 BC. The Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, all these empires, they had legislated law and in fact they had specific details as to who should be fully veiled and who should not be veiled. The opposite, Allahu Akbar. Today there is law that is banning the free, respect, respectable woman who is concerned of her modesty and her chastity. Today laws are being legislated to prevent her from putting on the hijab and from veiling herself. Whereas in those days, thousands of years ago, we claim to be living in the civilized world. But thousands of years ago, you found that law was legislated to prevent slave girls and to prevent women who were available to all, to put it mildly. To prevent them, law was legislated to prevent them from wearing the hijab. Because the hijab, the veil, the jilbab, the Islamic dress code was not just a mark of respectability. It was not just a mark of honor. But it was a symbol through which the despicable, the despicable was, 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 was discerned. And the despicable was set aside from the honorable. So historically as well we find that the hijab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us is something that was known to be the mark and the trademark of elite women, respectable women within the society. That was the trademark of a woman in pre-Islamic era. In fact, even in the Arab Peninsula before the advent of Islam, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came in the days of Jahiliyyah, there too also in that society, in that society already, hijab was introduced, the headscarf was introduced. A woman who belonged to the elite sector of the community, an honorable, respectable woman, would have a headscarf on her head. She would cover her head. And whichever woman was seen without the headscarf, was seen without the proper modest attire that woman was considered to be from those who are available for all. With the advent of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جُيُوبِهِنَّ Allah says the Muslim women, they are now required to draw the khimar over the bosoms. So the khimar was worn by the women. As we said, even in pre-Islamic era, in the days of Jahiliyyah, they would wear the khimar. Khimar refers to anything that covers the head. And that's why khamar, khamar which is wine, khamar is called khamar from khimar or khimar from khamar. The root letters are the same because when a person is intoxicated and he drinks wine, it clouds his brain and it clouds his mind. It's as if his head is covered up. And that's why khamar is called khamar. So khimar is whatever you put over the head. The scarf that you wear, the headgear that you wear is referred to as khimar. So in the pre-Islamic era, they wore the khimar. However, they would tie the khimar to the back and the ends of the khimar would be left hanging at the back while the entire front was exposed. So the neck was exposed, the upper part of the chest, the collarbone and so on and so forth was exposed. But the head was covered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then wanted that hijab that they were observing 
to be observed in the proper way and to reach its perfection. Wallahu mutimmu nuri. Allah will perfect his nur. Whether that nur is in the form of hijab, whether that nur is in the form of a minaret, whether that nur may be in the form of a masjid. Allah will perfect it. Those symbols of Allah, Allah will perfect it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the existing hijab that they were wearing, wearing to reach the point of perfection. So Allah instructed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the women in general in Medina to Munawwara, they were in Medina by then. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ عَلَيْهِنَّ وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ عَلَىٰ جُيُوبِهِنَّ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now they should draw the khimar over the front. So now they're not only going to cover the head, but now they should, rather than allowing the khimar to hang at the back, now the khimar should be drawn over the front so that the entire front area is covered up as well. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, commenting on this instruction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed to the women in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and every other Muslim woman, she says, مَا رَأَيْتُ خَيْرًا مِّن نِسَاءِ الْأَنصَارِ she says, I did not see women who were better than the women of the Ansar. She says, the moment this ayah was recited to them and they heard this ayah, immediately what they had done is they started tearing off pieces of cloth from their waistbands. They started tearing off pieces of cloth in order to cover that area up. The, again, the hijab is a symbol of your submission to Allah. I think we have misunderstood the objective of hijab. This is what you call an expression. An expression of your Commitment to the deen of Allah, an expression of your submission and obedience to Allah, that immediately, instantly, I don't have to go home and ask my husband whether I can put on the khimar or not. I don't have to go and even ask the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whether I should don the hijab. I do not have to go back home and ask my teacher or ask my dad whether I can wear the hijab or not. Allah has said, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جُيُوبِهِنَّ It's not a symbol of oppression. It's not a symbol of male domination. It's not a, just a piece of cloth. It is a symbol of your submission to Allah. It's a symbol of your obedience to Allah. When you understand it that way, it makes it so much easier for you to put it on and care less of what everyone else has to say about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah of the Quran so here Allah speaks about the khimar the headgear or the scarf that she should wear elsewhere in the Quran Allah speaks of the jilbab ya ayyuhan nabi qul li azwajik wa banatik wa nisa'il mu'minin yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihin tell the women tell your wives they are the role models Tell your wives, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell your daughters, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell the women of the believers that they should draw over themselves the jilbab. The jilbab, a loose outer garment to cover up whatever it is they are wearing. Why? The slogan out there in today's world is dress to impress. We believe in that as Muslims. We believe in that slogan, dress to impress. But we add something to it, dress to impress Allah. When you're standing in the mirror, admiring your dress, the question on your mind should be, will this impress my Allah? The dress that I'm putting on. And this applies to both men and women. So how do we react? Obviously, we should voice our disapproval. We should use whatever means is available to us to make our feelings known regarding any such law that's legislated. It won't make a difference. 
but you did whatever was in your means. But more importantly, we are an ummah, we respond, we react by amal, practice. That is what Allah wants to see from you and I. Hijab has been banned in one part of the world, in many parts of the world. France was the first to ban the hijab. Recently, well not recently, over the past few years, Sri Lanka has banned the donning of the hijab. In certain countries, the headscarf is allowed, the burqa is not allowed. In certain countries, the veil is not allowed. You and I, who have the freedom to put on the hijab, who have the freedom to put on the modest Islamic dress code, how are you going to react? Amal. When the Prophet ﷺ was attacked, his honor was attacked, his dignity was attacked. He was called a madman, he was called insane. How did he react? Amal. What was the amal? He displayed the finest character. And people who came and said, on the one hand we're hearing this about him, but look at this man. He's quite the opposite. Amal. You and I, that's what is required from us now more than ever. The need of the time. Our Muslim mothers, sisters and daughters. Now is the time. The opportunity that Allah gives you to remind you of the freedom that you enjoy. To freely exercise this right of yours. To freely exercise and to express your love for Allah. Brothers, there's an, there's an alarming rise, there's an alarming spike in the number of our mothers, daughters and sisters who are leaving their homes without the proper dress code, the Islamic attire. That's the symptom. Sometimes we're trying to treat the symptom. And by the way, there's an alarming rise in many of the brothers whose shorts are getting shorter and shorter. You might end up with boxes. That is aura. As much as that woman, the hair is aura. Aura means it's part of the private organ of the person. The thigh of a man is aura. The knees are aura. They must be covered at all times, whether you're working out, whether you're having a swim, whether you're cycling, whether you're biking, whether you're hiking, whatever it may be, that remains the aura. It must be covered. And that is connected to haya, haya, modesty, bashfulness, chastity, directly connected to haya. And haya is directly connected to iman. Al haya u shu'batum min al iman. Haya is a branch of Iman. Iman is the root. Iman is the trunk. The branches are connected to the tree trunk. So the root cause or the problem, like I said, these are symptoms. Failure to apply the proper and the correct Islamic dress and attire. That is a symptom. The root cause is directly linked to Iman. The conviction of Akhirah. Look, not any one of us would want to be shrouded in a coffin that leaves the aura exposed, right? If you had to leave behind a will and you were given the option that look, Allah wants you covered in this way, but would you like us to dress you in a pair of boxes and send you off? Or the woman is given the option. No woman, wallah, regardless of the level of her iman, no woman will want to be sent off to Allah with her hair exposed. No man would want to be sent off and would want to be shrouded in a coffin that leaves the aura exposed. When a person is mayyit, the person is dead, a lifeless body, no one has any inclination towards that body there's absolutely no desire towards that body yet that body is covered up how much more should that body not be covered up when that person is alive 
and there are people looking at her, gazing at her, watching her, and there's a desire within the heart. So for you and I, over and above the dua that we should make, it's time for amal. And do it. Do it for the right reason and the right purpose, which is to express our submission and to express our obedience and love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us the understanding.